Okay. Good afternoon and welcome back. Um, let's open our Bibles to the book of John, chapter 11. And we're going to look at the passage starting in verse 1 uh, and all the way down to verse 22. So let's do that right now. John, chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 22. The Bible says, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus, of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with the hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Verse 4. When Jesus heard that he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea. Again, and verse 8 says, His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that, he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Verse 14, Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Verse 18, Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, and Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And verse 22 says, But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt, Ask of God, God will give it to thee. The message uh, for this afternoon is, He may be late, but he's still on time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again, Lord, for allowing us to be together, dear Lord. Now, Lord, I ask you, please bless this message and speak to our hearts once again, dear Lord. I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, I heard this story about a legal firm in Los Angeles who sent some flowers to an associate in San Francisco who had just moved into a new office. Um, but the florist made a mistake. The banner on the flowers read, with deepest sympathy. And when the florist was told of his mistake, he said, oh no, then the flowers that went to the funeral uh, said congratulations on your new location. Now can I say something? If the person who had died was a Christian, the message on that banner was not all wrong. 
You see, that's exactly what death is for a Christian. It is simply moving to a new location. Because the Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So when those we love die, uh, if they are Christians, we know that we're going to see them again. Amen? Um, the story today is about another Christian who dies. His name was Lazarus. And many of you are familiar with this, uh, with this man and with his family. There were three members in that family. There was Lazarus, there was Martha, and Mary. Now, I like the meaning of the name Lazarus. Lazarus means God has helped. God has helped. And then we're familiar with Martha. Martha was the busy bee. She's always busy. Uh, she is a hard worker. She is the one that pays the bills. And uh, we also know about Mary of this family. She was the listener. Whenever Jesus came to the house, while Mary was in the kitchen, you know, cooking up a storm, uh, there was Mary, and she was always sitting at the feet of Jesus, just paying attention uh, to him and hanging on every word. That was Mary. And so there, this was the family. But uh, in our passage today, we find this family in distress. Um, Lazarus is dying here. And Martha sends Jesus a message. And the message is, uh, Him whom you love is sick. The one you love is sick. And we need you to come here right away. You know, I want us to study this passage today and see that even if God is late, He's still on time. Have you ever prayed and you feel that God is taking too long in answering His prayer? Um, have you ever asked God for something and you think that He is just taking way too long in answering, giving you the things that you want. If that, if that has ever happened to you, and it has happened to me, then this message is for you. Uh, in, in this message, we want to understand why sometimes God delays His coming. This passage here will give us some understanding why sometimes God does this in our lives. And there are five truths uh, we, I want us to look at very quickly in this message. Let's look at the first one. The first truth that I find in this message is that one way God answers prayers is by saying, wait. One way God answers prayers is by saying, wait. Um, Sometimes when we pray, God can say yes to our prayer right away. He would do that often with Daniel. You remember, Daniel was not finished praying, and God would send angels to him and, and, and ask him, okay, what, what, what do you need? And we're here, and God, God heard you praying, and, and, and he sent us. And, and so sometimes God answers like that. And, you know, sometimes God answers our, our prayers by saying no. It just, just plainly, just no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, he did it with Paul. Remember Paul prayed? Pastor was preaching about that the other day. Paul prayed and, and he had this problem, uh, you know, in his body. And, 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 and what did Jesus say? Jesus said, no, basically. You know, my grace is sufficient unto thee. So sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says no, but sometimes God says, wait, this is not the time yet. 
Let's look at our uh, passage once again. Look at verse 3. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Verse 6, When he had heard uh, therefore that he was sick, he abode, listen, two days still in the same place where he was. Uh, so it says there, in verse 5, that the reason why Jesus delayed his coming, the reason why Jesus said, wait, this is not the time yet, the reason we find in verse 5 is that he loved them. He loved them. Now, you and I may not understand that. Because well, if we love somebody, we want to do you know, things right away for them when they ask for things. But God has an agenda that sometimes we do not understand. And so the Bible says very clearly here that the reason why he delayed his coming, the reason why he said wait, is because he loved them. Not because he ignored them. Not because... He didn't care, but because he loved them. He loved them. Now, there was no text messaging in those days, and there was no email. And so Martha had to wait two full days before she uh, got her answer. Two full days. Can you imagine that? Nowadays, we text people. And we want, you know, answers right away. We, we, we may text somebody and, 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 and man, and, and, and why is, is this person not answering? Why, why, why am I not getting a, an answer yet? And, and what's, what's going on? We want answers right away. And how long has it been? Man, it's been a full 30 seconds. But Mary, or Martha rather, had to wait two days. She sent this messenger out. And then and, and the messenger two days later comes back. But there was a problem. The messenger was alone. That's right. Where is Jesus? Messenger why, was by himself. Have you ever been stood up? I mean, you had a date with somebody, you know, and, and you got all nice and ready and and you got all decked out, and, and, and you went to this uh, fancy restaurant, and you're, you're waiting there, and the, uh, uh, you know, the, the waiter comes, and, and would you like to see the menu? And you say, no, I'll just have some water. I'm waiting for somebody. You know, and a few minutes later, he comes back again, and, and would you like to see the, the menu? And no, no, I told you, I'm, I'm waiting for somebody. You know, and, but that person doesn't show up. And... Uh, and, and you find yourself there just waiting and haven't been stood up. Has that ever happened to you? Terrible thing, you know. Um, and so this is exactly what happened to, to Martha. The message was, Lord, the one you love is dying. Lord, but the, see, the, the message could have been from somebody else. Not just for Martha, the, the message could be, Lord, uh, the, 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 my mom is dying. The message could be, Lord, my son is dying. Lord, my brother is not doing very well. Can you come? Can you do something? Uh, Lord, uh, I have this, this need, and, and Lord, I, I, I feel alone, and, and Lord, I, I, I feel discouraged. Can you come and help me? Lord, I have this problem, I have this need, and I need you at this time. But Martha was stood up by Jesus. She felt let down. Have you ever felt let down by God? Have you ever prayed a prayer that you know it, it doesn't go past the ceiling, and, and you pray, and, and you wait, and, and nothing happens. 
Has that ever happened to you? You know, sometimes the toughest answer to receive from God is wait. It's very difficult. Now, when this happens, we need to remember that God is still God. We need to remember that God is still in control. And God is still able to handle our situation. You see, we need to allow God to continue working in whatever way he sees fit. Because he knows what's best for us. He knows when to do things. And we must learn to trust him. I love what it says in Psalm 143 and verse 8. It says, cause me to hear thy love and kindness in the morning. For in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. For I lift up my soul unto thee. That's a great prayer. To pray to the Lord. Lord, help me to trust you today. That's what we have to do. We need to learn to trust them always, no matter what the answer is, because sometimes God is not always going to say yes to our prayers. Sometimes he may say no. Sometimes he may say not yet. You have to wait. You got to hang in there. And in those times, folks, we need to learn to trust him. He's still God. And he's still on the throne. So the first truth, again, that we find in this passage is that one way God answers prayers is by saying, wait, the second thing, and I love this one, the second truth that I find in this passage is, do not put a period where God put a parenthesis. Do not put a period where God put a parenthesis. I want you to see this in, in verse 2 in our passage. Verse 2, notice that verse 2 is in parenthesis. It says there, It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now, in, in spite of everything that is happening at this time here, we know what's happening. There's, uh, the family is in distress the brother, you know, is, is dying. Obviously, Martha feels terrible. She sends a messenger. Mary feels terrible because, you know, it's, it's, their brother is in the brink of death. Obviously, they're distressed. They are troubled. They don't know what to do. The only thing they can do is, is send for Jesus. Jesus, come and help us. So the family is in, in great distress here. And it's a terrible situation to go through. Obviously, when you have somebody that you love, you know, that is sick, and you know that uh, maybe that person uh, will die unless something drastic happens, that person will be gone soon. And it's a terrible thing. And so that's the situation where we find uh, these two sisters. But listen, I love what the Holy Spirit does here for us. And, and again, during this time, this family is in great distress. They don't know what's, what's happening. We can see what's happening when we read our Bible because hindsight is always 20-20. You know, and, and we can see perfectly what's going on, why God does things. You know, we, we see that here, but obviously they did not have the luxury of having a Bible and reading what's coming, what we do. And so, but it's something, it's something that is, that is very interesting that I find here. In verse 2, the Holy Spirit lets us know what's happening. Because it, it, it's, it's kind of strange that what we just read in verse 2 has not happened yet. You know, if you have never read the Bible, if you have never read John, and you're reading in order, and you come to chapter 11, and you find verse 2 here, and you read that, 
you would be kind of lost because you would not be familiar with uh, the you know the with the with the events that are happening and so verse 2 is actually a preview of what's coming and, and and this is found in chapter 12 don't turn there but in chapter 12 uh, is what um, is actually when this happens here in, in this parenthesis. But isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit of God put this parenthesis here, this sort of preview to let you and me know that even though this family right now is in distress and they're going through a difficult time, you know why the Holy Spirit uh, tells us uh, this here is to remind us that this is not the end. There is more coming. In chapter 12, things are going to be different. Right now, things are bleak. Things are difficult. The family is in distress. But the Holy Spirit here is telling us, hey, uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Things are going to uh, look up. Things are going to change. Mary, in chapter 12, will be worshiping Jesus once again. Things are going to be okay. And again, this is the Holy Spirit telling you and me today that there is hope and things will change. You know, many Christians find themselves in chapter 11. But I think the Holy Spirit uh, gave us this parenthesis here because he was basically telling us, hey, I want you to see yourself in chapter 12. Um, I want you to see yourself worshiping. I want you to see yourself uh, praising God once again. I want you to see yourself serving God once again. I want you to see yourself healed. I want you to see yourself being a blessing to other people. I want you to see yourself optimistic. I want you to see yourself, uh, you know, being happy and content again. I want you to see yourself with peace and with joy. That's what the Holy Spirit wants from us. He wants us to see ourselves in chapter 12. And not only that, but the Holy Spirit reminds us that the end of life is not in chapter 11. There is a chapter 12 coming. Not only that, there is a chapter 13 coming. Not only that, there's a chapter 14 coming, and a 15, and a 16, and life goes on, and there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is more coming. And I think that's great. We have to focus on what's coming, not in what you're going through right now, if what you're going through is not that great. I love what uh, God says in Jeremiah 29, in verse 11, Jeremiah 29, 11, God said, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace, and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Verse 12, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And so he says, Hey, I'm not going to let you down. Just hang in there. There is hope, and I'm always here. Do not put a period where God put a parenthesis. Truth number three, the third truth that I find in this passage is, is that sometimes we need to start taking the Bible symbolically. I know it sounds kind of strange, but let me explain. Sometimes we need to start taking the Bible symbolically. Look at verse 11 so that you can understand what I mean. Verse 11 says, um, then, um, verse 11, these things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, 
but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Right? So Jesus here is speaking symbolically. You see the symbolism. He's saying he's asleep, right? Uh, but see, the disciples take this uh, literally, right? Look at verse 12. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. <laughs> but then uh, the Holy Spirit explains to us, verse 13, how be it Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep, right? Then in verse 14, look, verse 14, Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Hey guys, he's really dead, all right? And so sometimes, you know, when we read uh, our Bibles, we see things too literally. And you know what happens? What happens is that we fail to apply God's truth when we do that. We see things too literally when we should see things symbolically sometimes. You know, Jesus used a lot of symbolism when he spoke. Uh, Jesus, for example, talked about a seed falling into different grounds. Remember that? Now, when he said that, was he teaching people how to farm? No. No, he was using symbolism there. And so, listen, today as we read this passage, let us not miss this. Because I want to remind you today that everybody has a Lazarus. That's right. Now you may be saying, no, but I don't have a brother named Lazarus. But you see, your Lazarus is not necessarily a person. You see, your Lazarus could be a problem in your character um, that you may think that it should have been fixed by now and you have sent a message to Jesus and, 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 and according to you, God still hasn't helped you with this problem, right? And you still have this and you've been waiting. And so that could be your Lazarus. Your Lazarus could be uh, a problem, you know, that you, that you have. Um, you know, maybe problems at work, maybe problems uh, in school, maybe problems in your family, and you have called unto God, and Lord, I, I need your help. I need you to come now and help me. But God is delaying his coming. And what is going on? I, 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 there's no answer from God. Your Lazarus could be a disease. Maybe it's, your, it's a disease in your body. Maybe somebody that you love is sick. You know, and you've been praying for such a long time, and that, that person is not getting better. That could be your Lazarus. Your Lazarus could be somebody that, that you want God to save, maybe in your, uh, in your family, and you've been praying now for years, and, and the person still hasn't come to Christ. And you're wondering, well, where is God? I've been, I've been praying all this time, you know, and, and, and God is not answering my prayer. So your Lazarus could be that. Your Lazarus could be a bunch of different things. And your Lazarus in your life, is that something in your life that has made you question God? And has brought doubt into your life? That could be your Lazarus. And so we all have a Lazarus. I get a kick out of what Thomas says in verse 15. Uh, look, verse 15. Jesus says here, verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. And then I, I, here's what Thomas says, verse 16. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now, 
he said this because he thought that uh, if they went to Bethany, if they went back to, the, to that area, that they, they were all going to die. Uh, verse 8 explains to us why he said what he said. Look at verse 8. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? So here the disciples are, are saying when they, when they hear Jesus, because Jesus had said, okay, we're going to go you know, to that area, to Judea, to, to Bethany. And, and so the disciples are like, Lord, remember that the last time you were there, they tried to stone you and kill you, and now you're planning to go back? What's going on? And so that's why Thomas now is saying, okay, Jesus has decided to go, you know, and uh, uh, Lazarus is dead. Jesus is going to be dead. So let us all go and die with him. You know, how optimistic, right? <laughs> and you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of Thomases <laughs> in our church, always doubting God. Maybe there is a Thomas in your family. You know, uh, oh, COVID-19, we're all going to die, right? <laughs> and so, have more faith. Uh, there will be a chapter 12 in your life. Amen. Let's look at truth number four. Truth number four in this passage is this one. Sometimes God uses tragedies to get people back on track. Uh, verse 17 says, Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave Four days already. Verse 18. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 fur furlongs off. And verse 19. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now, what a tragedy for this family. Lazarus was dead. And, and people that heard this you know, they came to uh, Martha and Mary's family to pay their respects. It was a tragedy. It's always tragic, you know, when, when you lose somebody that you love. And so we find this tragedy here. You know, often it takes a death for God to get hold of people's hearts and change them to the people that he wants them to be. Sometimes it takes tragedy uh, for someone to remember that God exists. Sometimes the only way that God will be able to bring somebody from, God's, uh, from outside of God's will and bring them back into God's will is by allowing some kind of tragedy in their life. It's the only way that, that this will happen. I heard about a certain family in a southern church who had been inactive for years. The family simply never went to church. Uh, you know, and, and, and every effort to attend had failed. I mean, the pastor had sent flowers to them. The, the, the pastor had sent uh, letters to them, invitations. He had sent pies. He had sent visitors to visit with them and encourage them to come back to church, but to no avail. The, the family just did not want to go back to church. One day, one of the sons named John was bitten by a rattlesnake. You know, and, and obviously the, the father took him to the doctor. The doctor gave him the you know, anti-venom and medicine, but it wasn't working. He wasn't getting any better. And so the father then immediately sent for the pastor that he might come and pray for John. And I want you to hear what this pastor prayed. As he began to pray, the pastor said, O wise and gracious father, 
We thank you that you have in your wisdom sent this rattlesnake to buy John in order to bring him to his senses. He has not been to church for years. It is doubtful if he has ever before in all his life felt the need of prayer. Now we pray that this will prove a valuable lesson for him and that it will lead to his repentance. And we also pray, oh, Father, that you should send another snake to buy Sam and another one to buy Jim and another to buy the old man. We have been doing everything we could for many years, but all our efforts could not accomplish what this snake has done. And so we conclude that the only thing that will do this family any good is rattlesnakes. So please, Lord, send them bigger and better rattlesnakes. Amen. <laughs> you know, God may be using this pandemic to bring the, to get the world back on track. But I wonder, what rattlesnake is he perhaps using to get you back on track? The fifth truth that I find in this passage, and the last one, is my faith should not be based on circumstances. My faith should not be based on circumstances. Um, I love seeing Martha's faith in verse 22 in our text. In verse 22, in spite of everything that has happened, listen. She says, But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Can you hear her faith in those words? You know, her faith is not based on circumstances. Her faith is based on the promises of God. And she says, I know. And it reminds me of other uh, people who said the same thing. For example, Job, in ver, uh, chapter 19 and verse 25, he said, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Paul was able to say, I know. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep me that which I have committed unto him against that day. They said, I know. Do you know today who your Savior is? Do you know who your God is? Are you trusting Him? You know, this is where you and I need to be. Because how I feel about God should not be based on what is going on around me, but on who He is. Folks, even if God is late, He's still on time. You know, He may be late in your schedule, but He's still on time in God's perfect timing. I like what someone said. When it's not in God's time, you can't force it. When it is God's time, you can't stop it. I like that. You know, God was 25 years late getting Abraham a son. He was 15 years late fulfilling Joseph's dreams. He was 17 years late making David the king of Israel. 
and he was four days late coming to Bethany. But in each one of those instances, God was still on time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, dear Lord, for reminding us today that even though to us it may seem that you're late, you are still on time. Thank you, dear Lord, because we understand that even when you delay your coming, even when you may say wait to our prayers, we understand that you still love us and that there is a good reason why you may be saying wait. It's not time yet. Thank you, dear Lord, for the truths that we have learned today. Help us, dear Lord, to apply these truths to our life. Dear Lord, I ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.